This is recording. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll convene this uh, meeting of the board, the Santa Rosa Valley Water District, and we'll take the uh, roll at this time. Holly, would you please go ahead and take the roll? Director Ferris? Here. Director Falls? Here. Director Henry? Here. Director Moran? Here. And President Swan? Here. Uh, so we've got, let's see here, unfinished business 2A. Rick, want to go ahead and... Uh... Thank you, uh, Chair Swan. Can you hear me okay, Chair? Fine. Great. Well, first off, I want to thank the board for convening and those who have joined uh, uh, from the public uh, on short notice. Uh, I'm planning to give you an, an update on the district's response and the state of the district uh, in response to the, the CV, uh, the CZU uh, lightning fire that resulted in a evacuation of 100% of our, our water district. Um, as part of my uh, update, I'm on, on, we'll call on a couple of uh, department managers, staff members, to give uh, a little more in-depth uh, update, uh, especially on water quality and on the district hey, watershed. All right. Um, Over overall, uh, the district, can we mute that? Can we get some muting that? going, please? Uh, have a good night. Thanks. Can we please mute some of these? If you're not a speaker or participant, would you please mute? Thank you. Overall, the district's water system is in good shape, um, all except for a few outlining areas. Uh, the majority of our water system was not impacted by the fire. Uh, we are still supplying potable water um, and will be supplying potable water in most of our system. Uh, the Scotts Valley, Lompico, Ziani, the town of Felton, uh, most of, uh, um, and most of Ben Lomond. We do have some outlining areas that were uh, impacted um, by the fire. Uh, in the far reaches of Boulder Creek, the upper Riverside Grove, our upper reaches of uh, Big Basin Way, uh, Boulder Brook Drive, uh, Featherston uh, in Felton, a very small portion of Featherston uh, of our Felton system that were impacted. And our major impact to the district was our surface water intake supply lines. Uh, all in all, approximately a little over seven miles of high density polyethylene would cross uh, the district's uh, watershed to bring surface water into our uh, lion water treatment plant was completely destroyed by fire. It was an HDPE pipeline placed above ground due to the, the steep topography, the lack of uh, equipment access, uh, it was, it's very much like a park-like setting, uh, a trail as the pipe, you know, weaved in and out of redwood trees and, and, and went closely through the canyons of the Ben Lomond Mountain. That was 100% destroyed. That's a major impact to the district, not only in cost, but the, avail of the ability to uh, use surface water in the upcoming winter seasons. The other areas, uh, that we have uh, impacted. Um, we come to the conclusion that today, as of today, we have approximately 300 connections that are out of water in our total system. That's in the Riverside Grove area, the Eckley area off of Highway 236, the Blackstone area just outside of Boulder Creek, our South Reservoir area, which is high reaches of Alba Road, the Featherston area, Boulder Brook Drive, and our Lion Zone. Um, so to total, we, we believe we have about 300 service connections that we are working to restore water. We believe that we will have water restored to most of these areas by the end of next week. 
We are already in the process of uh, procuring materials, temporary piping, uh, uh, temporary storage tanks were received today. Um, materials are on order. On order. Uh, contractors have already been uh, on site, starting to facilitate some of the larger repairs that district staff cannot complete ourselves. So we are, we are fully in recovery mode. We have uh, increased water supply in back into the areas that CAL FIRE um, asked us to isolate in order to keep water in the active fire areas, which was our Highway 9 corridor. We've restored water out to Bear Creek Road, water all the way out to Riverside Grove, and some other outlining areas. Um, mostly the water system is in really good condition, except for these outlining areas. We do have a, a, a water quality issue that I will ask uh, our water quality supervisor, Nate Gillespie, to uh, inform the board of here shortly. That is a result of the melting HDPE pipe that we will discuss more. I can give you a quick, I'll try to give you a quick rundown, a lightning round of the areas of damage. Um, starting with, we, uh, we had a water line, a two inch water line break in Felton by a Cal Fire bulldozer. Our Bennett Spring raw water line has fire damage. We need to replace 700 lineal feet of four inch. Um, we also need some more investigation uh, and assessment at the, at the actual intake box. Bull Spring, which is in Felton, we're unable to access due to still has active fire. We cannot get into uh, that area. The South Reservoir up up Alba Road, there are four HDPE tanks that possible, uh, with that possible heat exposure that may need to be replaced. All the above ground HDE piping was destroyed in the tank area and the supply line from the tanks down to their booster, which is in Brookdale, was also destroyed. It was an above ground high density polyethylene line. Along Alto Villa Road in Brookdale, we lost a section of four inch high density polyethylene to fire uh, that needs to be replaced. The Blackstone tanks in Boulder Creek, we lost two 10,000 gallon HDPE tanks to uh, fire damage and the above ground plumbing to those tanks need to be replaced. The replacement tanks were received today and will be craned into location uh, planning tomorrow afternoon. The Eckley tank is a 10,000 gallon HDPE tank. It experienced fire damage and it requires replacement. That tank also arrived today. We also lost in that area. That area had pretty good fire damage. Um, we lost the two inch HDPE piping from the tank to the booster pump station. The booster pump station was destroyed the pg e power drop was destroyed by fire, SCADA control was uh, destroyed, and communications between the booster and uh, the tank was destroyed. So there's a considerable amount of work to do there, but it's a small zone. It only has about you know, 12 connections in it, but we will be working to uh, restore. The, it was interesting there is the water system was impacted, but the residents are all still standing, which is great news. So that's an important uh, zone for us to get back in service because they will be re-entering hopefully soon. Uh, the big steel tank is one that you've all heard about. Uh, all above HDPE piping uh, in the vicinity of the tank was destroyed. Mainline valves on the tank, uh, their um, resilient wedge uh, seatings were uh, damaged by fire, by heat. We lost a, a 12 inch, 10 inch and six inch HDPE. HDPE pipelines between Big Steel, Lion, and Little Lion. They were all destroyed by fire. Those three tanks are welded steel. The tanks themselves are in great shape. However, Big Steel tank were concerned about uh, melted HDPE leaching into the tank, so we will be doing a scrubbing of the tank before we put it back in line. And that's a rather large tank. That's a million and a half gallon tank. The electrical between all of those tanks was destroyed by fire. There is a considerable amount of tree damage in that area uh, that we are in the process now of removing some large fir trees that are, are burned up the center. Um, we have a consultant, uh, a forestry consultant on scene there now evaluating and we're removing all of those tanks so we can safely, or trees, so we can safely get in and start to replace the main line. 
we have a contract crew that is already on site and is starting to uh, work on uh, restoring mainline and getting materials. Uh, the big steel booster at, at that location, its power was lost, skater control was lost, and the HDPE pump up line to Lion Tank was lost. Uh, at the district's largest facility, the Lion Tank, the overflow and transmission HDPE mains to Big Steel and system were destroyed by fire. Contractor is on, uh, on location and is starting uh, the repairs. The Foreman Creek intake and raw water supply line of the treatment plant, the above ground HDPE Foreman Pipe raw water line was destroyed by fire. The Foreman Creek diversion structure has fire damage to the intake structure. The turbidity station building was completely destroyed by fire. We have a contractor uh, in the process now moving forward with replacing the 12 inch water line that was uh, destroyed by fire, approximately 3,360 lineal feet um, to the, from, the, from the actual intake to the treatment plant. It's important that we get some water back into the treatment plant. The treatment, treatment plants do not like to be just shut down uh, and not have water running through them. There are many chemical feed lines and small orifices and tubing that become plugged uh, if you don't continue uh, usage. There's also other moving parts, um, chemical uh, feed, metering pumps and so forth, that it's important to keep those in service. So we're working uh, to get the Foreign Creek uh, intake back online and start getting some water through the treatment plant. Uh, cool Creek intake and piping, uh, again, that was another above ground eight inch HDPE that was destroyed by fire. The wood diversion was destroyed. Further assessment and uh, material procurement, procurement is, is needed. Um, this uh, Cool Creek intake will be a critical winter intake as this stream typically flows cleaner from turbidity than the rest of our, our, main, uh, uh, our main intakes. Cool Creek is a, it's an interesting, I think it's part spring and part creek, but the water that flows there is, uh, can be used for, for treating much sooner than our other sources. So we feel with the fire damage to the watershed, it's imperative to get this intake online. Peabine intake and raw water supply line, again, uh, we were unable to access still because there's still some uh, active fire, but that's an 8,000 lineal feet uh, HD 8 inch HDPE piping from mapping and discussion with Cal Fire. The entire pipeline has been destroyed by fire. The five mile pipeline, which you've heard a lot about, staff has been unable to assess the five mile, which is uh, five miles plus of six and eight inch high density polyethylene above ground piping. From mapping and discussion with Cal Fire, the entire pipeline has been destroyed by fire. Further assessment needed. At our Riverside Grove tank, far north Boulder Creek, it's a large welded steel tank. The tank is in good condition, but the Riverside Grove tank pg e power drop and SCADA control was destroyed by fire. Uh, big concerns here in the 16 and on the 1,620 acres of watershed, uh, which Carly will speak on, that uh, was consumed by, by fire. There are huge concerns going into the winter months regarding erosion and landslides. Um, into our intake structures or what's left of them or into the streams or just uh, landslides in general on that watershed. Uh, we estimate we lost approximately 175 water meters that have been destroyed by fire. Um, that could be plus or minus. Uh, we did lose uh, two equipment on uh, some equipment. We lost two trailer mounted air compressors and one 45 kW mounted generator, which was one of our older generators, which was due for surplusing. We lost a flight pump that was in storage, which is roughly a $15,000 pump uh, that was in a storage building at Lyon that was destroyed. One lawnmower, three stamp sampling stations, and a construction uh, trailer. That's kind of our list of damage to date that we know about. Um, I'm sure this list will grow. Um, but we are moving forward as expedient as possible to get these areas restored in water. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, turn it over uh, to Nate Gillespie as uh, our water quality supervisor to speak about, uh, we have a, a very challenging water quality issue ahead of us. Nate? Oh, and yeah. uh, 
Pardon me, uh, Mr. Rogers, Chair Swan, uh, Nate, uh, for just a moment. Procedure, as on a procedural point, I see that some members of the public have been using chat to try to communicate with the board. And um, I would just ask for Brown Act reasons, we try not to use chat. There will be an opportunity for members of the public to um, address the board with questions at the end of the discussion. So uh, for anybody who's, who's tried to use the chat function, if you could please um, hold your comment and make it to the board when we reach the uh, public comment period, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, as Rick had mentioned, uh, we have quite a bit of uh, um, uh, melted HDPE uh, mainline out there in the district. So uh, what's been learned from the uh, tubs and the campfires is uh, um, the melting of these, uh, these plastic uh, uh, HDPE mains uh, can release uh, volatile organic compounds or VOCs. Um, also, when the system is depressurized, that can uh, create back siphonage, which has the potential to uh, suck VOCs back into the water distribution system. Um, so we're, uh, um, we're in a relatively unknown, um, uh, we, the areas that have been depressurized, it's, it's unknown right now if there's VOC contamination. Um, so as a precaution, we're going to be needing to uh, getting some uh, uh, appropriate notices out to protect our customers' health. Um, so the district's actively working with uh, our regulatory agency, the State Water Resources Control Board, about what the appropriate notice is that we need to give to our customers um, in the affected areas. Um, so we've got a, a, a robust uh, sampling plan planned. Uh, once we can restore water in these areas, we plan on flushing them and following up each depressurized zone with uh, VOC samples as soon as we can. Um, we've also sampled uh, areas that have been unaffected out in our distribution system just to you know, make concrete sure that we, we don't have uh, widespread uh, VOC contamination. Um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, benzene is a, is a primary concern of uh, chemicals that can be released under uh, pyrolysis of uh, HDPE mains. Uh, the VOC screen that we are uh, using is EPA method uh, 524.2. That includes a screen of roughly 84 VOC compounds. Uh, we have taken a couple of samples as previously mentioned in the unaffected areas we expect to have those sample results uh, from our contract lab uh, about midweek next week at the latest. Nate, do we have an idea of, of how long we may have to keep uh, a do not drink order? Yeah, so I, uh, in the, uh, the tubs fire as well as the campfire, uh, those notices did last for uh, roughly uh, eight months to, I believe, up to 15 months. Um, just the uh, uh, um, VOCs uh, back siphoning into the distribution system. What can occur to my understanding is some of those VOCs can adhere to uh, biofilm in the pipe walls, it can adhere to rubber gaskets in the distribution system, and it can just be really uh, tricky to remove. So um, again, that's going to be part of our uh, robust sampling once we, uh, we get um, water restored to our uh, areas that lost pressure. And that's one of the reasons that we are removing as much as uh, the damaged uh, HDPE products such as the tanks and piping. The pipe may look that its integrity is still restored, but we don't want to take a chance of even the heat can release those byproducts. And we feel it's important to cut that out and get rid of it instead of let it go down into the distribution system. If we start chasing that around our distribution system and really have to do a, an increased sampling uh, a program, you know, the samples are, are $300 a piece. There's uh, at least a, a 24, 48 hour turnaround and, and plus staffing time could be quite expensive, not to mention 
probably the, the worst of this, the prolonging a uh, do not drink order. Do you want to add anything else to that, Nate? Um, that's all I have for now. All right, thank you. So we will be getting out notices, uh, we hope, very shortly on these areas. Some of the areas that are very small satellite, we are going to the door and leaving notices to make sure there's no confusion. Um, we will be using changeable message signs in some areas because of the large amount of uh, influx in, in people and in firefighters that the, the state wants to ensure that we are notifying not only the homeowners, but people coming in. So we'll be using changeable message signs for that message and we'll be able to move those around the district as needed as well. Um, on moving ahead on this repairs, uh, I have uh, uh, contracted with three different contractors. One contractor is working on tree removal up at the lion tank on the damaged uh, fire uh, the trees that the fire is damaged so we can move in and safely put back our pipelines. One of the biggest con safety concerns with Cal Fire right now is that they're getting trees just falling for no reason that have been damaged by fire and it's causing uh, a lot of access problems um, and road closure problems as well. We have another contractor out that's working on putting back the 12 inch Foreman Creek raw water supply line. And then we have another contractor working on replacing all of the piping um, through uh, the big steel Lion and Little Lion Tank. We're replacing that HDPE with uh, ductile iron and bearing. That is probably one of the most uh, important pieces of our distribution system that resulted in the loss of 50% of our water storage that we do not want to go through that again. Uh, we are also moving ahead starting the first of next week with three temporary employees, basically people who live in the community that are qualified to do maintenance work Pulling, pump, pulling pipe, uh, assisting uh, district staff and uh, hooking up uh, some of these smaller areas. We're working on that. And we are working on uh, a new, uh, an engineer from the firm of Sandus uh, brought in today to work with staff. Uh, it's a civil engineering firm uh, in uh, Campbell. Uh, they will be working with staff on writing assessments and on design and getting uh, some of our system back up in operations and working with FEMA representatives uh, on damage assessment. So we're moving through that. And with the different, with the list of things that I talked about, um, I have a, 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 an updated price. Uh, the board has already approved at its last, uh, one of its last emergency meetings, uh, the district manager for $200,000 to do replace the piping between Big Steel, Lion and Little Lion. Um, what I just went through, that list of damage that we're working on, the replacement of tanks and above ground lines will be an additional 341,000. Uh, so I will be asking the board tonight to approve an additional uh, $350,000 in emergency expenditures. These are not one contract, these are for materials, these are for some labor, um, some of it's the rental, uh, the, the changeable message signs. Um, all the different things that we're doing now, um, the staff's running around and doing. So I will be asking uh, the board to approve that as well. Um, is there any questions on damage before we kind of move into operations? Uh, I have a question for Nate, if he's still, in, still part of the group. Yes, he is. Go ahead, Lou. Is it okay to proceed, President Swan? Yeah, go ahead. Nate, I have a question for you. You said you're doing a screen test for VOCs. Are you looking or thinking about doing any specific chemical tests for what we know to be known plasticizers in the HTPE? For example, sterate I know is, is in there and it is a known enzyme inhibitor for biosystems. Um, any thought given to doing more testing than just the VOC screen? Yeah, so the EPA method uh, 524.2, it does include 84 compounds. Um, of that 84 compounds, a lot of those are, uh, again, uh, degraded plasticized uh, compounds. Um, I believe styrene is included in that list, but um, uh, it, it does include 84 compounds in that, that screen. So 
uh, we feel like those results will adequately um, net us with some, some really good data on uh, uh, what we uh, may or may not have as far as contamination. And a second question, any idea how long the state will require us to continue this testing until we are, to, until we are assured that uh, our, our chemical levels go down, back down to normal? Um, I can't speculate on that right now. Um, I, I would expect until we are below the MCL for all uh, VOCs. Yeah, that will, be, that will be determined by the first round of testing. It sounds like we'll just be spending quite a bit more in testing. Is that, would you agree, Nate? Yes, we will be spending a lot more in testing. Are we gonna have an estimate of that cost anytime soon? Um, sample wise, I can't uh, estimate at this time, but uh, we do know that they are uh, $300 per sample for a uh, uh, 48 hour turnaround time. And again, and again, that'll determine, be determined on our first round of testing when we get the results back. And that's the reason we're going in and replacing a lot of this stuff too, is so that hopefully we don't have VOC hits come back by removing the HDPE and the polyethylene pipes that are there now. Any thought given, Nate, to the fact that the chemicals uh, were, are released into the ground as well and could potentially end up in the groundwater? Uh, you know, the, the affected area right now is not near our, uh, our, our well field. Um, I would have to consult with a hydrogeologist on uh, um, potential contamination uh, related to that. I guess I'm worried about the rains coming uh, in, the, in the rainy season, washing some of that, those chemicals into the, the creeks and getting into our uh, feed system. Thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, again, I'd, I'd have to defer to a hydrogeologist on that. I'm, I'm not an expert in uh, uh, migration of uh, um, chemical uh, uh, contamination yeah. with groundwater. That's a great point, Lou. And, you know, this watershed we share basically with the city of Santa Cruz and we're collaborating with the city. And we will bring that up and talk because the city and our district are very concerned on how we maintain our watershed and how we go back into, you know, to control erosion and so forth. So that's something we can bring up uh, and Carly, I'll have Carly bring that up to the group uh, to discuss because it, you know, you look at the five miles, it goes all the way across the watershed. Um, there, there may be that potential and it's, it's worth at least discussing at high levels. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Okay, with that, I just, I want to leave before we uh, go on to a couple other options. I, I want to leave, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my apologies, Bob. No, no problem. Um, I had my hand up, so maybe it didn't get seen. Um, just a couple of questions here on the, it sounds like there's an immediate movement to replace the Foreman Creek uh, supply line, the 12 inch. That's correct. That, that's the shortest one that we can bring water, surface water back to the treatment plant relatively quickly. The five mile is gonna take some discussion. Right. Um, what, and the peat mine is gonna take some discussion. What kind of pipe are we using for that? Right now I'm using HDPE pipe for that. Um, it'll either be a temporary until we decide what we're gonna put in for the, the final, or we will go back in and bury that pipe. It'll be one or the other. And um, part of the discussion around this is relative to what FEMA will pay for versus what we pay for. Um, well, I, I believe what the discussion will be, what, what's best for the district to harden the, these pipelines uh, so this doesn't happen again. You know, each time we well, have these disasters, we try to learn and, and, and that's why HDPE was used. So I will, with this engineering firm that we hired, we will be discussing with FEMA that we want to put this back above ground and HDPE is unacceptable. And I believe that we can uh, negotiate with FEMA and they also want you to put it back so it doesn't happen again. Um, and, but this is not gonna be an easy task on the five mile. Environmental, constructability, cost, 
will be all something that we have to look at. You know, there'll be some real discussion about uh, replacing that pipeline. Um, the Foreman Creek, we can put it back quick and come winter, you know, right now it's a little fortunate because our district, as you know, Bob, is a, a 50%, roughly 50% split between surface water and well water. This is our low flow time for surface water. So right now it's not too bad. And we know from past practice that when we get rain, that Foreman Creek can supply most of our water system with surface water. And we can drive to the intake, we can get water and maintain it and operate it relatively easy. So this is the most important one to get back and that's why we are working on that right now. I guess my, my primary concern, um, just a sec, you know, Lois, I've got a, a couple other things I want to mention. My primary concern is the replacement of above ground pipe that melted the HDPE with HDPE. Um, I, I guess what I'm hearing you say is that all of the replacements that we're planning and doing that you've mentioned in your report with HDPE are considered temporary? That's that correct. correct. That's correct. I, I think we might want to emphasize that as part of the report. We will. Um, a, a little bit more. Um, I know there's a you lot know, of pe people concerned about that. To go, some of it we're putting back in steel, like the stuff between uh, Lion and Little Lion. It is just too important to the district to mm -hmm. lose that again, or even to wait. Uh, um, I've talked to some people at Cal Fire and they'll tell you that sometimes you can have refire in an area up to three times. And because this fire has gone so long that some of this fire is deep down in the soil. And the last thing I want to do is do some replacement of HDPE, you know, and have fire um, uh, degrade the pipe as soon as we put it in. So we're taking special precautions. We're trying to scrape the ground. We're getting rid of these trees that are causing us, us problems. Um, and we're putting a uh, steel pipe in and burying it uh, in between these three critical reservoirs. You know, very important. But there will be a lot of discussion. And, you know, I wouldn't doubt because of this and because of the fires up north um, and the, the problems with HDPE, I wouldn't doubt that state health would not allow it coming, uh, you know, in our standards. They may not allow above ground in fire areas. I could see that because um, they're very concerned. And there's, like Nate says, there's not, not a lot known yet, but we do know it's a real issue. Well, my, I, I just don't, don't want the HDPE that we talk about replacing on an emergency basis to be considered permanent. I, I, I'd like it to be explicitly labeled as temporary if that's in fact what our intention is. Can uh, I can already do. do. Yeah. So second question was around the clarification of what do not drink means. Um, so there's very hard to hear, Bob. I understand do not drink, but there's Bob, a lot of other. We can't, questions. you're very muffled. We can't, we can't understand you. Probably the mystery meat broadband again. Sorry about that. Um, I, will, I, will, I will turn it over to Steve on drop off and I'll be right back. Okay, Bob will save his question when he comes back um, or at, the, at another time. Rick, you, you want to proceed? I think Lois has questions. I see some other board members with questions, maybe. Lois, you got your hand up? Go right ahead. Yeah, I had my paw up. Am I unmuted? Yeah, you're fine. So, uh, Mr. Rogers, I was wondering how long have those pipes been above ground? I think uh, James and I just had this discussion. What did we come up with, James? Five mile pipeline has been on the ground, on top of the ground for 23 years. Okay. And about the same the, for the other ones too. Yeah, and all the plumbing and everything, uh, big steel and lion, that was done in 90, 94, 95. So it's about 25 years. And P-Vine, I think, was done right around the same time as Five Miles, so probably 22 years or something like that. Okay. And it was in excellent shape. Don't, you know, HDPE, if it's installed correctly for that application, the way it bends, uh, it was in very good shape when it was uh, damaged by fire. Yeah. 
Okay, just wondering because there were some rumbles out there. No. And I really thought those pipes had probably been there a, a long time, and I was right. Okay, that's that's it. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks, Lois. Bob, Bob's back online. Okay. You're muted, Bob. Go go ahead and have Rick go, and then I'll I'll. All right. So, so I have a, a, a comment and a question. Um, so my understanding is that a lot of rural forested areas use the same kind of piping. So we did nothing exceptional. It was standard practice to use this kind of piping. Correct? Correct. Piping. City of Santa yeah. Cruz also has that up north in their system. Right. And a lot of places up north on the Sonoma fire, the campfire, the car fire, all those have, every, everywhere uses that same, uh, same style. Thank you. And so my question is for Rick or James is, could you uh, give a brief uh, layman's terms uh, description of how the water was lost from the tank? I don't want to, you know, so happy. what happened is the piping, there's intense fire around the tanks and the piping in between the tanks was all melted. And when that melted, the tanks just started draining through all the inlets and outlets on the tank. So there, each tank had multiple pipes coming in and out of it. And so out of each, and they're, they're very big pipes, they're 12 inch, eight inch, six inch. And so it happened very quickly. The water just came flushing out and we weren't able to get in there because there was active fire. And it was kind of suppressing the fire around where the firefighters were at the same time. And so we weren't able to get in there and they didn't have anything to turn the valves off with. And at that point it was a loss. Okay. Thank you. Bob, you're back. You're muted. Do I sound better? Yes. Okay. Um, Rick, as part of maybe, um, I don't know if it's now or, or later, but I, I'd like to get some clarification about what do not drink means. There's, Obviously, I know you don't want to, you know, drink it as you drink a glass of water, but there's also a lot of other uh, uses of water um, that, that someone might do, cooking, showers, you know, that sort of thing. And I, I'd like to make sure that we um, cover uh, what sure. people can and can't do when under a do not drink order. And I'll ask Nate to answer that because he's been working well, very closely I'll, with our health rep. I'll put a little bit into that. So... It's a do not drink, do not boil notice. So that means the water is not even, should not even be used for cooking, drinking, anything that you're gonna ingest, any way you're gonna ingest the water, that is what that is going to state is do not drink, do not boil. And yeah, if I, it gets really bad, it'll go to a do not use. Yeah, I understand. I just think we need to be very clear with people because, for example, people in the shower can sometimes get it in their mouth and eyes and ears and that sort of thing. And so, you know, just understanding what those parameters are, I think, is really important. Sure. I'll go yep. with Nate, to Nate on that yeah. with the mouth and eyes and ears. There's a lot the shower. to this. I'm not sure how that all works there. There's a lot to this, and we hope to have much better information on our website, but I'll let Nate, you know, these are volatile organic chemicals. Nate, you want to take the lead here? Yeah, so uh, when we do get our notice out, again, we are working with our regulatory agency on this notice right now and how to best protect uh, our ratepayers' health. Um, and this notice will include um, uh, things such as, uh, uh, you know, do not use to cook with, do not use um, to brush teeth with things like that. Uh, it, it will be clear on the, uh, the notice, um, you know, uh, clarified activities. And yeah, thanks in, in lay, in, in lay terms so yeah. that it's easy for people to understand. And we can um, put some information on the website, what it's safe to use for, you know, uh, you know, such as, you know, great. uses and so forth, et cetera. And then my last, my last question, Rick, it, uh, on the 350,000 you're asking for, it wasn't clear to me what the uh, what that scope was. Was it for everything that was on your report, or was it uh, for a subset of that? I, I wasn't clear. Well, it's 
it's a kind of uh, it's it's embedded in in my report, and you can see it. It's it's the pipe that we're running for temporary. Um, it's materials and some labor and some equipment to get back in water. It's not to any one contractor. It's spread out to the tank manufacturer to well, well, um, well for, several well, for projects. example, it's several projects. I understand, but for example, would it include cleaning out the big steel. Yes. Uh, in, includes the big steel booster. Yes. Uh, includes the uh, interconnections. Well, we already talk, talked about the interconnection. It would include the Foreman Creek intake. Yes. No. no it won't stuff. include anything to do with the the. You know, well, uh, that was in the two hundred thousand. That was in. Uh, no, that is in here. I, I apologize. That is in here. Yes, it'll include the Foreman Creek intake. Okay, so it will include everything but the Bennett raw water line, the Bull Spring facilities, the um, uh, Cool Creek intake and piping, the Peavine intake and piping, the Five Mile piping, right. and everything else other than those is included in the 350. Right. It won't include the watershed because we don't know what's going on there yet. Right. Um, these are, uh, again, the remedial uh, procurements to, to get us back in water on the temporary. And uh, there's, you know, all these uh, raw water supply lines will be bidded projects, RFPs, and so forth. Um, and we will discuss at a later term. But this is, most of this is in, embedded in this list to uh, get this moving forward. Yeah, I think. I it think includes 25,000 for temporary labor. Um, you know, it, it's got, it's what we need to move forward. And I'm already spending some of it, to be honest with you. No, I understand. I, it's just that from the report and the number, it wasn't exactly clear which ones were which. And I just wanted to make sure we were clarifying that for everybody. Well, that's on the you know, my intent was to have this on a little better spreadsheet of what needed to be done, what's being done. But we we run out of time. I understand. Thank you. Uh, Rick, just uh, with respect to the, the VOC contamination area specifically, what part of the district are we talking about? Nate, do you want to take that or do you want me to take it? Yeah, so uh, we're looking at the big steel pressure zone north. Uh, from my, uh, that includes uh, Bear Creek Road areas, that includes up Highway 236, that includes all the way up to the uh, Echo uh, pressure zone, including Riverside Grove. Um, I believe the, uh, and, uh, Rick and James, you can correct me uh, if I'm uh, wrong here, but the southern boundary of this notice would be at the um, Highway 9 and uh, uh, I'm at a Alba. loss of the Alba. Alba. Yeah, yeah, Alba Road. We calculated approximately, um, Chair Swan, at 2,800 connections, plus or minus, we'll have a do not drink order. And will that include the east side of Highway 9 as well? Up in this, in the Boulder Creek area, yes. Because it's one we do plan on issuing a map along with the do not drink, do not boil notice as well, just so uh, it could be a lot clearer uh, who is and who is not affected. As part of this moving in, since we're talking about water quality of the do not drink, we're moving ahead on putting in a 5,000 gallon bulk tank somewhere in Boulder Creek with potable water that customers can come and fill five gallon containers. Uh, we will we will contract with one of our local uh, haulers and have them keep that tank full with potable water. So folks who live in the area of do not drink, we will we can supply them with water if need be. I'm you know from talking and I'll get to this. Uh, we talked to a gentleman from another uh, agency, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Dave uh, Pedersen, and he went through this with the uh, the Woolsey fire and. Customer outreach, customer service was imperative to reach out to your customers, not wait for them to contact us, but for us to reach out to them um, so they don't have uh, you know, further uh, discomfort trying to, to get through this. So we will be putting in uh, somewhere in Boulder Creek and maybe right here at our office in the backyard, a 5,000 gallon portable uh, potable tank. And we will offer that for people to come in and fill as needed. Uh, in five gallon containers. Uh, we feel that will be uh, 
very important to reach out to our people. Um, you know, we, we also will be reaching out to the people who lost their homes. Um, we're somewhere around, I don't know, 200 plus or minus. We're out um, uh, cataloging those addresses and so forth. And so I intend to have staff reach out to those people. We do have a catastrophic uh, um, failure for uh, reduction in water rates uh, and uh, to uh, waive the, the monthly service charges for those people who lost their homes. And the last thing we wanna do is, is send a bill out to somebody that lost their home. Um, we wanna be proactive. We wanna reach out and talk to these people um, I think the board should uh, consider um, also to the people that did have uh, high usage during the fire that we reduce their uh, water bill back to their normal usage uh, this time of year. I know we're going to have some high water bills from people who have sprinklers on, but they did that in, a, in an act of desperation um, to save their homes. We made it through, we did go around and turn a lot of those off, and most likely there will be some high bills, but I really think this is a time that we need to extend um, uh, exceptional customer service. So it may not be pleasant to deal with a, with a government agency, but at least I'd like to see people walk away and say, hey, you know, they were helpful, they helped me out, and uh, you know, we're looking uh, on the road to recovery. There's not that many. There's no reason why we can't be proactive to reach out uh, to those folks in those affected areas um, and move ahead with that. Um, and that's just kind of on the customer service end. We are trying to get people back into our, our front office for phones, for customer contact. Uh, we hope next week we will be uh, restaffing our office. You know, we, we kind of forget, a lot of people forget about COVID. Uh, we were still in the COVID COVID, COVID problem um, with social distancing and, and uh, all the different safety procedures that we were moving on. You know, our front office was closed. We had unique uh, working hours. Um, we will be trying to restore uh, our front office as I, I feel it's essential that we have staff to uh, um, reach out to our customers uh, and work with them. Um, other things, you know, staff is working, will be working seven days a week until people back in water. Like I said, we were looking to bring on three temporaries and I do believe, James, you can help me out here. The three people that are, I do believe they live in the district, I hope, before I. Yes, so right now I have two that live in the district. One lives in Ben Loman, and one lives in Boulder Creek of West Park. Um, and I have been reaching out for a third and I've, inquired on a couple people, one being an employee and a member of the district that works at the Shell Station at Ben Loman, and one being a member that works for Morgan Scarborough there at Scarborough Lumber and Ben Loman. So I'm trying to reach out to those two guys, get their contacts. And first one that gets back to me is the one that's going to get hired. So, so I just that, hope they get back to me. That'll be a short period, hopefully a, a, a in the area about approximately a month um, of temporary labor. And those temporary folks will work side by side um, with district staff. They'll be non-benefited positions, part-time. Uh, they'll go through uh, our basic hiring uh, process. Um, and we hope to have those folks here because uh, we need hands, we need additional people. We're still running our water system. We're still finding leaks. And we're still doing a lot of monitoring of the distribution system and storage by driving around. Um, we hope that Comcast will get back up and running. Power is just about restored, and correct me, staff, am I wrong, to all of our facilities from PG&E. Um, so we're looking good with power. Now we're trying to get uh, uh, communications restored. Our radio system uh, has worked pretty much flawlessly. It's been a great, uh, a great system. Um, we're still moving forward, but I kind of, as I close with my, uh, with my update, I, I just want to say that the district's water system, in large part, you know, remains uh, in good operational condition with storage and potable water. 
We do have some small localized areas that have fire damage uh, that we are addressing, but for the most part, our water system is very strong. Our well field is up and running. It wasn't uh, uh, a little over a year ago that uh, this board approved uh, rehabilitation of several of our wells. And that has paid off because the production has been strong from our well fields. We are moving some surface water from the town of Felton, which we briefly met with our fisheries biologist or our fisheries uh, uh, person uh, to talk about the increased water that we're using. He is going to go out and walk the creek and, and do some inspection. You know, we are uh, increased our flows there. We have moved water um, from the north-south inner tie. We have not purchased any water from other water systems. Uh, Scotts Valley water, Santa Cruz water have all graciously, and Soquel water have all graciously offered help and are, are staying uh, in close contact with the district, which I appreciate. And I can't speak enough about the staff and their response to uh, getting our people back in water. I probably forgot something with that. I'll turn it uh, back over to the board. I guess I haven't asked Carly. Carly on watershed. I see watershed that it's not crossed off my list. To briefly talk about our watershed. My apologies, Carly. Before you change, Rick, you want to get Bob's question in. Bob, sure. you got a question with the, what Rick's been talking about? You're muted, Bob. Sorry about that. Uh, on the tank for uh, folks to get drinking water from, what could, there's a lot of businesses that are going to be affected in this area, and I'm wondering what we, what we might be able to do to help them out. Well, I spoke with uh, Boulder Creek Fire, and uh, they have a representative, one of the, one of the commissioners is, uh, I, I do believe he's an officer in the Boulder Creek Business Association. And they're reaching out to businesses, not just in Boulder Creek, uh, but to businesses in general to uh, see what their needs are and concerns. And I spoke with them today and he's still contacting people, but he hopes to get back and, and give that information to both us and Cal Fire. Well, that's, that's, that's assuming they know about this situation where you know, we've got some uncertainty about being able to supply um, drinkable water up there for at least some period of time. The, some of the businesses in the area are going to be severely impacted by that, I think. Um, probably. So I'm, not, I'm not sure what we can do, but we probably need to huddle with them to see if there's something that can be done. You know, and I, I don't, I don't want to guess, but I'm hoping that the Highway 9 corridor because it stayed pressurized and water coming, passing through. Um, I hope sampling will show that uh, our downtown areas will clean up and it'll be these little zones, these high reach little zones that will have the water quality problem. But I can't guarantee that until Nate does his robust sampling protocol. Right. But well, let's, just keep it, let's keep the businesses in mind once we Definitely. get more information. Definitely. Thank you. Carly? Great. So as Rick mentioned, um, we do believe that a majority of our Ben Lomond Mountain watershed property was burned. Um, that's approximately 1,600 acres. Uh, we don't know the extent as of yet, um, just because the fire are still active in those areas. So we haven't been able to actually get out there to assess. Um, the good news is, is that Cal Fire's watershed emergency response team, known as WART, arrived today and we'll, beginning, we'll begin their assessments this next week. Um, we've spoke with the CAL FIRE team lead who will also be working with CDFW and the county very closely. They'll be determining the burn intensity and soil condition, soil condition and then determine um, where rehabilitation needs to take place at, from fire breaks um, such as dozer lines. The county is going to be providing CAL FIRE with all the mapping from the district. We've actually provided that to the county so far and then have also reached out directly to the response team lead with CAL FIRE to offer um, assistance with any touring of our properties or um, additional mapping. Um, right now, it's pretty much just a waiting game to be able to get out there and fully assess the situation. Um, and like I said, we're going to keep in close contact with both Cal Fire and the county to make sure that we're involved in the entire process. 
Any questions on watershed? You're muted. Right? I have a question for, for Carly. Uh, Carly, has our partnership with Panorama been of help here? It has. They've actually put completely switched their gears um, and are helping us with the post-fire response. They're also going to focus a little more on post-fire response um, in the management plan that was actually going to be released in its draft form next month. Um, so they're going back to the drawing board a little bit to address those concerns. Um, they've also put us in contact with a lot of these different team leads um, as far as the response goes. And they're going to hopefully work closely with us to be at the table as a representative for the district just because we have limited bandwidth with staff at this moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If there's, if there's no other questions, I turn the page here and I have watershed and I have finance and uh, we have not uh, given a chance for our director of finance, which is probably very Bob's important got a question, to uh, hear from. Bob's got a, go ahead, Bob. Uh, I think more of a comment, you know, due to the absolutely heroic efforts on the part of our volunteers, um, you know, they were able to stop the fire at, at Highway 9, but the east side of Highway 9 is still you know, in the same conditions that the west side was before the fire and, you know, the heartbreaking loss we've had of all, a lot of our uh, community's homes. So I'm hopeful that this fire preparedness effort and exercise will continue because, you know, our entire community is not out of danger at this point. And that's certainly going to be true going forward as well. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, do you, uh, from finance, from the finance perspective, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, finance perspective, I mean, we kind of already discussed that we have generally about $3 million in cash reserves. Once we get these projects figured out and estimated and we actually get our FEMA allocation, we'll be able to go out and get the, the bridge loan for all of these projects. Um, I've reached out to Wells Fargo, who we bank with, um, Santa Cruz County Bank reached out to us, and then also Chris Prulitz, who's obviously very familiar since he just did our $14.5 million financing. Um, everyone's pretty much ready to go once we get some of those different items. Um, from a customer service standpoint, you know, staff's been answering and calling back every single voicemail and every single email. Um, with answers that we're able to provide to the, the best of our capabilities. You know, we have a lot of people asking for very specific information about their specific address, you know, which the district at this time isn't able to, to necessarily confirm that type of stuff. Um, so we've been trying to, you know, stay in touch with our customers as best as possible going forward. Like Rick said is, you know, we are going to have some that are going to, um, you know, exercise our, our catastrophic event policy um, to where we'll have some not being billed. Um, fortunately, you know, a majority of customers' homes, you know, it didn't, it, the fire didn't impact as many as they thought it could have. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, that still leaves the district in a stable position. It's obviously going to be a long recovery. Um, you know, a lot of people, pretty much everyone, was evacuated. So there's always a lot of different costs and constraints um, that people have there. So we'll just continue to work with our customers and we'll likely have some different um, action items at you know upcoming board meetings where we may need actual direction from the board for which route we wanna take. But in general, um, you know, we have a little bit of a financial stability right now. Which is great on that. And I, uh, you know, through this, through the fire, I, I have to shout out to our council, our district council, who's been so valuable on working on agendas and legal contracts and, and all the things that you may not think is, or I may not think are, are important, but are very important. And she's been a tremendous help. And I, I just want to thank her. Uh, she set us up with a meeting with, with different people who have been through this, through the fire uh, and FEMA and 
her resources and her help has just been greatly appreciated. I just wanted to, to tell that to the board. Um, so with that, um, Gina, do we need to do anything for a request for additional funds? Uh, yes, though I, I, I could propose a motion um, for the uh, authorization for the amount that you uh, discussed. But before that, I think it would be good to get public comment. There were some folks with hands up and um, a couple of chat questions that would be better posed during the public comment period. Okay, thanks, Gina. Let's go to the to, for public comment. And uh, now we've only got one hand up at this point. Let's deal with Tina. You're recognized. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a, a few questions. Um, so first of all, you mentioned this tank, the 5,000 gallon tank that is planned to be in downtown Boulder Creek for potable water. And I think that's great. I think I was gonna be one of my original questions is like, if you have a don't drink water, where do you get the water? So uh, my question is whether that water is going to be free or is it something we have to pay for um, by the five gallons? And are we only supposed to bring five gallons? I'm, five gallons away at a time. I'm just a little concerned that like, you know, if I use more than five gallons in a day, then how's that supposed to work? And I'm, you may not have the details for that yet. And I completely understand. Um, but I'm also wondering if you're planning on putting another tank, maybe somewhere farther up 236 or somewhere where it's not so convenient to come into town to get water. And um, that'll be my first question. And I'll pause for that. And then um, we, we plan to offer that water free. Um, you know, we don't have all the nuances figured out. You know, if someone comes in and needs a, a hundred gallons or uh, something like that for horses or, or, or an animal or some other use, we'll make arrangements. This is strictly, you know, to get people back in small quantities of water, um, you know, five gallon. And I use the five gallon, uh, cause that's something you can carry to walk up to and fill. I picture this as a tank with, with three spig at least three spigots. And we'll, you know, we'll see what the response is. If there's a line to it, obviously we will uh, move and, and get a second if need be. Um, there are, and if you had a tank or something that you wanted to fill, we, you know, contact my office and uh, we could go to other parts of the district um, where bulk water uh, we can get from a fire hydrant or something or another source uh, and not take from, you know, what people are, are coming in and get small quantities. The bottom line is we will work with you and I don't anticipate charging at this time. And I have water tenders readily available yeah. through contractors in Boulder Creek and in our area. All right. And if, if we need to put a, a station somewhere else like North Boulder Creek or something, uh, uh, those logistics can be worked out. Well, thank you. Um, so my next question was, I know this is an emergency meeting, so this may not be, um, uh, in your pur purview at this time, but I'm concerned that even when the water tests are safe and um, people from, or, or even if the water's being pulled from unaffected areas, that people will still not trust that the water is safe. And I'm just concerned that, I'm wondering if you have a public relations strategy in, or even are considering a public relations strategy in the future um, so that the public can um, start to trust that the water is safe when you announce that the water is safe. So obviously that's not the case now, but maybe in months from now when that is the case that people are still going to be skeptical. Sure. Um, considering like the watershed and so forth. And, um, you know, so anyway, that's, that's my other question. And again, I, like, I don't expect you to have an answer right now, but I'm just wondering if that's something you're considering. It's a good question. We just hope it's short lived and we'll go from there. And then the, my last question was whether or not the, there's anything the public can do to help uh, restore water efforts. Conserve water until the, the fire is out, until there's less fire trucks in the, in the valley. When you stop seeing fire trucks, you, know, you could probably more or less go back to your normal. But conserve water right now because we still are restoring water um, to some areas and, and we do not have our surface sources. So 
water conservation um, would be the best way to help us. And if you see a leak, report it. All right, thank you. And thank you to the board for uh, putting these emergency meetings together. I know it's a big, big task to be taking on right now. Thank you, uh, Tina. Any other uh, Three. The attendees? Three more. Uh, yeah, Beth Thomas. You're Hi. On. Um, I wanted to say that <clears throat> a number of these questions that have been so well answered for us today, including some of the things that Tina was just discussing, I think will really be helpful to the community if we are very clear in communicating with them, um, especially through social media, because everybody's so plugged into that during this emergency to begin with. I think it's people are really looking for that information. And I think you've got some great answers, Rick, and uh, and all the rest of your crew. So I think as much as we can explain those things, because you know, the stories do start to move around. Um, and I really appreciate all of the amazing work you guys have been putting in. And, and even the timelines of things seem like it's amazingly fast. So I know that the community is going to really appreciate that. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Lynn McGiven. You're on mute, Lynn. Hi, is that better? <laughs> yeah, um, I apologize. I tuned in a little bit late because I was out on the road. I'm I'm ho hoteled at Toll House uh, Hotel right now and trying to get back home. But I just want to be really clear. I I wasn't. I'm not, I'm not sure if we have water at our house or not. Uh, Lynn, if you if you contact me, if you contact me, this is Rick. Uh, send me an email with your address, and I'll see what we can do to answer that. I don't want to take the time. No, it's just it. it's just up at Bear Creek Estates. Is the whole valley out of water? No, the majority of our water system is strong and has good water storage and potable water. The North Boulder Creek area, some of the high reaches have issues, but James Bear Creek Estates, as of today, are we back? In storage? We have water in Bear Creek Estate, yes. 18 yes. feet in the tank. So you've got water in Bear Creek, but you will be on a, uh, a do not drink order. Right. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Finney. Hey. There, did I unmute myself? Mm -hmm. I did. Okay, thanks. Um, as, as Beth says, there has been a lot of questions and, and Lynn just demonstrated that. Um, at the uh, San Lorenzo Valley Post, we have been trying to get the word out to people um, uh, through our website and also through our Facebook page. I've been taking notes on the meeting. I know it is a public meeting, but um, I would like to try and get the word out from some of the agenda items that you sent out and, um, and from some of the notes that I've taken today. Um, is there anything that you would prefer we not put out to the public at large or uh, anything that you would like that we do tell people? Because a lot of people, the primary complaint that I'm seeing is my area wasn't burned, why won't they let us back in? <laughs> you know. So, um, and, and you've actually spoken to some of that. Um, well, and Chris, that's a Cal Fire decision, not the districts. The, I knew that. <laughs> uh, the repopulation uh, were part of that, but we do not make any of that decision. If you want, before you, if you have your questions, if you want to have a conversation this weekend, we can talk and go over your, your questions and answers. Okay, if you'd like, I can, uh, I can submit the, um, you know, what I write up <coughs> sure. for, for, for approval before we post it. Well, we'll review it. If you want to send it to Carly, we'll be more than happy to review it and, and add to it if we, if we see need to be. Uh, do I have Carly's email address? I can post that in the chat. That'd be helpful. Yes, thank you. Of course. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, no other questions from the panelists, but in the chat, we had a couple questions earlier, Rick, maybe you, from Irene uh, Lustig. She had a question about Brookdale specifically, wasn't mentioned in the list uh, of places that are okay versus not okay. Can you comment on the status of Brookdale? Uh, I, uh, Brookdale will have a do not drink. Uh, most of Brookdale is in water, except maybe the high reaches behind the Brookdale Lodge, or maybe a handful of homes that have issues. But Brookdale will be a an area do not drink. Okay, and uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Nicolette has a question about publishing the areas where water service is impacted. That was uh, you mentioned there was going to be a uh, a map published on the uh, I assume the website. Yes, we're, we're working on that now. Hopefully that goes out with all of the water quality, quality notifications. Okay, and uh, one other last question. Uh, it's uh, from Sarah Hart. Uh, she said something about uh, they're being required by their insurance to provide proof of loss of water to receive compensation for housing after the first two weeks of an evacuation. Is there a resource they can go to to get some sort of documentation to provide them with this? I assume the map that's posted might provide that. We, we will have those soon enough. We are right now compiling a list. They're being sent to admin staff as we're turning them off. Um, so we should have a list here soon of what ones we have turned off and what homes are burned here in the next few days. Probably, I would say, give it a deadline of Wednesday-ish. Okay. And, and we're, we are formulating a response through legal counsel right now. And I don't know, Gina, if you want to comment on that or not at this time? Yeah, I mean, there's not, there's not a lot um, that I can add to that. Um, my understanding from our discussions is that that information is being developed and will be right. provided with the note. And we will be responding. Okay, that seems to be it for questions uh, from the public at this time. Uh, so, Rick, is there anything else, or do we go to uh, close the? Uh, we have a, a request. I have a request for additional funds. Um, yeah, still need a vote. Yeah, in the amount of three hundred fifty thousand for the board to uh, take action. And uh, may, may I propose the language of a motion to see if uh, a board member will uh, adopt that? Absolutely, Gina. Okay, uh, the proposed motion would be to increase the total not to exceed amount for emergency procurement from $200,000 uh, by an additional $350,000 to a total of $550,000. Okay. I'd be I'd be happy to make that motion uh, as Gina stated, Holly. <laughs> grab that, and I'll second that. So, Holly, if you'd like to record a vote on that, no, I think you're still muted, Holly. Sorry. Yes, I am. I'm not any longer. Director Ferris. Aye. Director Falls? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Moran? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Holly. Right. Uh, I, I saw we had one quick question from panelists. Is the water safe to shower in in the do not drink areas? Nate, do you want to address that? I know we want to move on, but. Yeah, uh, we're still working with the State Water Resources Control Board on that. Um, uh, it, it, it'll be included in the notice, but um, I, I believe, you know, what we want to uh, do to expose um, any potential contamination is, is maybe uh, request uh, not showering with, uh, with hot water. Again, it'll be included with the notice uh, once we get that finalized, and we're hoping to do that uh, within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. And just note that he did say with hot water. Well, I think there will be a question about whether or not any of these chemicals damage any of the hot water heaters or um, 
hot water on demand or anything like that. So it's it's a very complicated water quality issue. I understand. But we need to make it simple, hopefully, for our I, I agree. There are a lot of questions. Um, with that, before we adjourn to close session, can I ask the uh, council to explain the procedures moving forward as we go to closed session and coming back to open session? Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, the first, uh, of course, there'll be public comment on the closed session item before uh, the closed session occurs. And then um, the board and the district manager and myself will leave the Zoom meeting um, and there'll just be a placeholder up during the, the Zoom meeting will stay active. There'll be a placeholder up for closed session. Um, once the closed session is completed on another platform, um, we'll come back to the Zoom meeting um, to uh, provide any report and uh, adjourn the meeting. Um, there's no more open business, open session business to be discussed after the closed session. Um, and unfortunately, I cannot answer the question, what time will return to open session? Uh, that simply depends how long the discussion goes. Nate, you're good to go now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. Okay, so the board will leave the meeting at this time. We'll, um, oh, we're going to have public, public comment. comment. We have public comment, yes. Oh. Thank you all. If there is it. I don't see any hands up on the public side here. No questions. So we'll adjourn to closed session at this time. Sorry. Okay, well, we have returned from closed session. We are now no, back in right right next to right bottom. And, uh, and we have nothing uh, nothing to report out of closed session. Does Bob, I mean, does, does Rick and Bob need to be Rick's there. Do we introduce any, any public uh, comments? Well, uh, President, President Swan, um, I just wonder if um, if we could get everybody to mute for a moment except for you, um, I think it was a, I, I'm not sure we heard the report out of closed, or the, your statement that there was no report out of closed session. I'll be glad to repeat it. So we are back in session and there's nothing to report out of the closed session. So at this point, do we, uh, see, I think we just, uh, do we just adjourn or do we give the public a chance to ask any questions after the closed session? Mm -hmm. It's up to you. There's no need for another public comment session, but you could request, um, accept questions if you would we like. Beth and Mark Smalley, do you guys have a question at all? Since you stayed on the line this long, I'll be glad to let you ask a question. No questions. Okay, great. All right, back then, uh, then this meeting shall be adjourned. <laughs>